Hi, everybody, and welcome to Code Break. We're all here together, and together we're hoping to build the world's largest live interactive classroom. Last week, we had thousands of viewers between Zoom and Facebook. Uh, all together, we had almost 15,000 people joining us. Uh, and we're hoping to build uh, a larger and larger audience each time. So as you join, if you enjoy what we do on Code Break, please invite other families, other students, friends to join us as well. Uh, I'm here at code.org headquarters. Uh, just kidding, I'm here in my living room because nobody's going to their headquarters. And I'm joined by my daughter and sidekick, Sophia. Hello. <laughs> Sophia is going to manage our sounds as, as we go along. And today we have two very special guests. Uh, the first I want to introduce is Alice Keeler. Alice, hi. And is Mike Krieger on already? Hello. Um, Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Doing great. Uh, so Mike is one of the two co-founders of Instagram. How are you today? Doing really well. Thank you. Good to be hey, here. Where are you joining us from? From uh, California, from Stinson Beach. Stinson Beach, California. Um, and uh, any thoughts you want to share with all the students who are at home while school is closed? Well, I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Um, it's really inspiring to see this many folks interested in learning more on how to code. I'm excited for the, the lesson we have ahead. Uh, I think we'll have some some fun doing doing the, the exercise. And yeah, I think it's a, it, I think back to when I was learning to code, I was born and raised in Brazil. So imagine me in Brazil with a book. That's all I had at the time. There was no real, you know, internet access to, to coding classes. And to go from that to now being able to meet other people who are also interested in the same thing and, and have all the, the classes online, I think is, is really an interesting opportunity for people to, to pursue their curiosity. Right, so we'll be, thank you. And, and yeah, it's been a major difference when I started learning as well when I was, I started when I was nine years old in Tehran, Iran, uh, very, very different experience than now. Um, so Mike, we're gonna be building an app uh, in the second half of the show, but I wanna switch to talking with Alice uh, briefly. Alice. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. It is beautiful weather out here in California. So both of you are in, from California. Um, and Alice is a superstar teacher who uses technology in her classroom. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, basically the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. I started teaching math in 1999. I have a degree in math and I inherited the laptop algebra program. So my whole teaching career has been helping kids learn math using computers. And I've also written some books for teachers. <laughs> oh, and I have five kids. <laughs> yeah, five kids, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm like with everybody else, I'm home with my family and my daughter Sophia joins us every week, um, partly to learn herself, uh, partly to keep me in check. Um, and she also has her app to make sound effects. So she's my daughter, student, co-host, and also part of the production crew. And we're gonna start uh, today with, with the computer joke of the day. Uh, so, Sophia, you want to ask the computer joke question? Why was the computer late for work? All right, Mike, Alice, any ideas? I got nothing. Mm. Because it had a hard drive. Oh. Okay. It had a hard drive. Drive. <laughs> My daughter's learning to drive right now, and believe me, it's hard. <laughs> Sophia is not happy about having to tell these bad jokes. Um, so let's get a chance to meet our, our audience. We have dozens of students on camera, so uh, we've switched to gallery view. So if everybody could wave and say hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Everyone. Hello. Hey. hey, guys. Hey. Hey. Uh, there's a whole audience that's also joining us from that's not on camera. And I want to switch to screen share to see where these folks are from. So I'm gonna share my screen to, we did a geographic poll as people were joining. Uh, that, other people in California with us. Yeah, some UK, wow, folks, looks like all the way over in India and maybe parts of China and Thailand, Antarctica. <laughs> Good coding, coding uh, opportunities there. Yeah, I'm not sure why we're <laughs> It happens. So besides saying, and by the way, it's crazy that there's people in China, in, in Eastern China, or in Hawaii. I'm not sure what time zone. In Hawaii, it's, I think, 7 a.m. Yeah. Uh, in China, it's well after midnight, I believe. Uh, 
Let's also, to learn more about the audience, I want to get a sense of what grade people are in. So if we could put up an audience poll for people to enter their grade band, uh, so we get a sense of the different age groups. So whether it's in the elementary school, high school, um, so on. It's kind of like it was first all out high schoolers, but we've got a lot of third and fifth grade students joining us today, which I have a fourth grader. Awesome. Yeah, we have kinders. All age groups. Me too. Yeah, everybody. Can you share the poll so everybody can see them? All right, so our, our biggest group is third, fourth, and fifth graders, but we have a little bit of a spread from all over. Now, no matter what age group you're in, it's never too late to learn computer science. So even if you, or too early, uh, <laughs> whether you're in your 70s and joining us or whether you're a beginner uh, or whether you're younger, there's different skill levels. So let's do another poll to just get a sense of the different skill levels of people, uh, whether you're a beginner or intermediate or, or advanced. Uh, and if everybody could just submit so we get a sense of that. Intermediate users got some pressure. Good. It's my first Zoom poll. It's very cool to see the votes come in live. Yeah, this is similar to most Zoom meetings, but the, the audience that's in the background that we have to do extra work to make sure they, they get a sense, a chance to interact as well. If we could yeah. share these results on screen as well. Um, nice, not intermediate. Across, uh, all, uh, across the, the range. And I wanna say for the folks who are beginners, we're gonna start at beginner level stuff and get uh, more advanced. Please stick with us, even if things go a little bit over your head or more than what you're used to learning, uh, you'll always be able to keep up with something. And if you're more advanced, uh, we'll try to make it interesting even at the early parts of the episode. Uh, and by the later parts, we'll be doing some fun stuff. One of the most exciting parts is we're gonna be recreating one of the features of Instagram live in code uh, with the co-founder of Instagram, which should be pretty interesting. Uh, as we're going along, if you're in the audience that isn't on camera, you can at any point ask a question by clicking the Q&A button. If you're on a touch screen, you may need to tap the screen to see this button show up. The team at code.org is gonna be answering questions live. So at any point, if you're, whether it's a question about this episode or just a generic computer science question, feel free to use that. And we'll take some of the best questions to ask of either Mike or Alice or myself uh, in the middle at the end of the show. We have, Three parts to today's episode. Uh, we're gonna start by learning about images and pixels as part of learning about digital information. Then we're gonna learn about color pixels. And then we're gonna build a feature of Instagram ourselves live. Uh, and as we go, we may have bugs that happen and we're gonna learn about a computer science concept called debugging. This is our fourth time doing this. So there may always be problems. Uh, Sophia's got a little bug that she's painted. So if we run into technical issues as we are sure to do, we'll debug them and figure them out on the fly. So these, please be patient with us. Uh, before we go into the, the, today's lesson on digital information, one thing I wanna do is I wanna welcome students to demo their creations. So last week we learned about encryptions and secret messages. And each week when you share your creations, we're gonna invite some of the best ones on next week's episode. Uh, so this week we wanna invite Anna. Anna, are you there with us? Yeah, I'm here, hi. Hi there, Anna. So last week we learned about making a password generator uh, and Anna submitted the coolest, more advanced password generator of all the, the students participating. Um, so I'm gonna screen share to show it, but you can say hi to, to Mike and Alice while I turn on my screen share to show your app. And I'm excited Hello. to see this. Thanks. Anna, where are you calling from? Uh, Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York. So this is Anna's password generator so you can choose how many words you want in a password and if i click you know this is a three word password so or mm -hmm. game near uh, and you can make so anna can you walk me through one of the features that you added to this to make it more uh, yeah so um one of the things i noticed was that in the original app you could end up with the same word twice in a password so i added a feature to remove that so the default is now you can only have each word once, but you can choose to have it more than once. And then I also added in number substitutions for some letters. So E is substituted with three, O and zero and things like that. Try this. So what would this be? So yeah, that would be, oh, the one is I, so that would be wild tried pure and it says underneath. Oh no, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Wow. Oh yeah, I can see it. So how Very did you cool. get the possible passwords down there? Um, so when you're 
I used at factorial. So when you are reusing the words, it's just the exponential. Um, but then when you're not allowing the usable words, it was the number of words factorial divided by the number of words in the password factorial. All right. That's cool. That's pretty cool. That's All right. So thank you so much, Anna. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share for a second. Uh, and I also want to introduce uh, uh, students that are basically working in our classrooms doing computer science principles. Uh, so computer science principles is the most popular high school computer course in the nation. Students are learning anything, everything from how the internet works to cybersecurity to learning how to program and build your own app. And in the programming unit, one of the things that these CS principles students are learning is how to use coding to create complex scenes. And we've done this before with the code.org artist tool, but what the high school students are doing are making much more complicated scenes. And we asked high school students from all around the country to submit their creations. Uh, there were a lot of really good ones, so it was hard to choose uh, the ones to highlight, but I'll, I'll quickly screen share to show some examples of these. Uh, so what you see here is basically uh, five different creations. Uh, this rainbow here with uh, and then this sort of thing, and then this uh, these hot air balloons in this city. These are all from different students around the country, and these may look like drawings you could make with a pen or or so on. But in every one of these cases, they're using computer programming commands, like the rainbows are parts of a circle, or the little cactuses have little lines, or so on. Uh, the one I want to go into more is this one that Kira made. So Kira is going to join us. Uh, Kira, are you there? Have we unmuted you yet? Yep, I'm right here. All right, so this is a presentation. Hi. Hi. Where are you from? I live in Rockville, Maryland. Awesome. I'm going to reload this so we can see. Oh, it looks nice outside there. <laughs> yeah, sun's shining. So this is the, the drawing that your code makes. If we look at the actual code for this, uh, there's quite a lot going on. Uh, oh, look at all those for loops. Many hundred of lines of code. Uh, but one thing I was looking through your code, I noticed basically these are the, this right here is the code to draw the stars. And you, mm -hmm. you have 300 stars, each at a random location. And yeah. some of them are of width 0.3. And then you draw some, you draw some bigger stars and then some strong, smaller stars at width, width 0.2. Um, and then even smaller stars. So as the code runs, there's a whole sort of different levels of stars being drawn. Uh, so each time you run this code, you basically see a different night sky because the positions and locations of the stars or buildings are randomized, which is kind of cool. I really like the comment getting uh, thicker as it goes along too. Oh, thank you. I think that was definitely the most complicated part because I ended up using circles with radii that were increasing incrementally and it was very difficult to get the position so that it was like arced the way that it does. So I think that was definitely the most labor intensive part of the code, but it's also the most satisfying to see when you run it again and again. Yeah, it looks very cool. Totally. I was just noticing how many of these functions you have with the positions. I'm thinking that had to have taken a really long time to figure out where all of the numbers are the between. Yeah, it was a lot of trial and error for sure. But eventually you kind of notice patterns with how far you need to move as you increase the radii and you decrease the distance between the points. So it got faster as I worked more and more. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kira, and hope you're doing well in Maryland. Uh, so today's episode, what we're going to learn about is digital information. So our special word of the day, where is my special word of the day? Is, two words of the day. There are two words, is digital information. And if you notice, I colored the I's and the O's differently because digital information is stored in ones and zeros. Computers use ones and zeros to, to represent information. Uh, and we're going to learn today about three different things. And we're going to start with images and pixels. So ones and zeros can be used to represent numbers, and there's a bunch of math that goes behind that. They can be used to represent letters, colors, sounds. But today what we're gonna learn about is how ones and zeros are used to represent images and, and photos. Uh, now, if you look at the ones and zeros, you don't need to think about the math, just think about the ones and zeros as lights. If you look at the monitor on your screen, every little dot on your screen is effectively a light, and it can be on or off. And in fact, the reason we use ones and zeros is because the electricity in a computer can be on or off like a light bulb. So when it's a one, it's on. 
When it's a zero, it's off. And so inside a computer, there's wires. And basically, the ones and zeros turn those wires on to have voltage or off to not have voltage. That's also what's happening on the screen of your computer as well. Uh, so every little dot on your screen can be on or off. And in fact, if it was a purely black and white screen, all we would need is ones and zeros to represent what's going on there. And so what we're going to do is a funky little exercise where the actual students on camera are themselves going to be individual pixels as part of an image. Uh, this is something we've never tried before, and it's a setup that's kind of funky. So we're going to switch into a gallery view where we see uh, 20 or so of, of us all on camera all at the same time. Uh, this is going to take a little bit of setup to do because different screens that students are going to be on, whether you're on a mobile phone or so on, might be slightly different. Uh, and we have a funky setup to try to get uh, everybody basically to see the same 20 students all at once. There we go. So right now we all see the same screen of 20 students, whether you're on a mobile phone, whether you're on an iPad, et cetera. Um, just so you know how we're doing this is pretty complicated. What, what's happening behind the scenes is there's somebody who's using a phone to capture a picture of Zoom and then streaming back from that phone back into Zoom. So we see all the same things. Um, so what we're gonna do, everybody on camera, uh, do you all have a piece of paper, like a white piece of paper? And can you hold up your white piece of paper? So when you hold up your white piece of paper, this is like you're holding a one. It's like there's a light on your screen and the light is on. And we have everybody uh, holding that piece of paper up, except I think Sophia, we don't see yours, and Akira, we don't see yours. All right, so that's everybody holding up a one. Now let's turn off our pieces of paper and everybody hold a zero, which take your pieces of paper down. So. Uh, now what I want to do, which we haven't really practiced or tried before, but we, what we want to do is try to spell something. So let's try to spell a C. Uh, so depending on where you are on the screen, see if you want, we want to spell a letter C. Is it along the top and sides? Yeah, along the top and then the left side, but the middle shouldn't. So Ryan, you should drop your piece of paper because you're... Sophia, you should hold up a piece of paper. Raizan, can you hold up your piece of paper? And JJ, if you could drop yours. If you hold yours closer up there, there you go. So this is kind of a letter C. And you can imagine this letter C, if this was a screen, some of the, some of the dots in the screen are white, some of them are black. And whether they're white or black depends on whether they're ones or zeros. Let's see if we can make a letter O. So the folks on the right side, can you hold up your pieces of paper too? And everybody else who was in the C, keep it up still. So Sasha, Pat, keep it. Patty and Caleb, and put yours down. JJ, there we go. So depending on whether we have these pieces of paper up or down, uh, basically we can sh show different things on the screen. So one thing we want to do is basically now try sh sending a pattern of ones and zeros to everybody who's on the screen so that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna copy and paste into the chat room a pattern of ones and zeros. So uh, Hannah, if you're in the background there, can you, can you all, if you look at the chat, there's a bunch of ones and zeros for different people in the first row to hold a one, then a zero, then a one, then a zero, in the second row to hold a zero, then a one, then a zero, then a one. Don't hold it up yet. What I wanna do is have a poll of the audience who's not on the screen, if you can look in the chat the code for what's going to be displayed is 10100101010101010101. And the question is, what is what is the pattern that this is going to create? So if we do a poll of the whole audience, is it going to be a smiley face or a flower or a star or a checkerboard? Let's see the audience guesses. We have a whole bunch of different guesses. People guess different things. No one. If you're not sure about the code, you can click on the chat to see the different options. All right. Uh, about half the audience has already voted, and the guesses are all over the map, but I think a lot of the students have figured it out. But not everybody has figured it out. Um, can we share the poll results? Oh, look at that. Checkerboard. Checkerboard. Actually, we should have done yes. it sharing the poll results. Can you hide the poll results? 
And let's basically, if you're in the, if you're on the people on screen, you see from your row what you should be doing. Uh, so if you, um, so in the first row, basically find your name in that row and then hold up your one or the zero, depending on what you are or whether it's a one or a zero. And I'm going to paste these values in the chat window again. There we go. So we sort of see a checkerboard. There we go. We're almost a checkerboard. I think Rose, yeah. somebody's got some ones or zeros off. But anyway, so uh, that's about as close as we can get to doing pixel photography with people on a Zoom call. Uh, and if you share the poll results again, basically the audience guessed it that the that the pattern of ones and zeros makes a checkerboard. But it would have been really cool if we could have had a flower or a star. Um, so that was basically how ones and zeros can be used to represent digital uh, photography. Um, and we learn now how a bit of a one or a zero can represent basically black or white. But you know, most pictures are not black or white. So let's talk about how we can use pixels to represent color. Uh, and we're going to basically do this with, uh, with I'm going to show a slide presentation about how this works. But Alice, do you, Alice or Mike, do you have any ideas about how we can represent colors using just zeros and ones? Well, sometimes if you if you go, I don't know if it works on these computers, but when you go old school computers, you got really, really close, you would see that there was actually not just one little dot uh, on every little row, but actually three little dots on every little row. Yes. Since I, I like to do HTML, I'm guessing it has to do with the RGB color code, which I never fully knew what that was, but I use it. So that's what we're going to learn right now. So this is actually a zoom in of an old school monitor. On old school computers, if you got close enough with a magnifying glass, you'd actually see little lights for red, green, and blue. So even though the colors on the screen might be white or gray, each of the little dots on the screen had three little lights. Uh, and each one of these lights had, can have information storing what color or how bright that light is. Now, if you had only one uh, bit of information, a zero or one for each light, you could have the red be a one, and what you'd see in that dot is all red. Or if the blue is a one, you'd see all blue. Or if the green is the one, you'd see all green. That's what would happen? my favorite. Yeah. But what would happen if two of these were a one? You'd get them mixed. Like red and green together is yellow. Is that what you've learned in school too, Sophia? No. No? No. Yeah, usually red and green is like this kind of, what color would that be? Brown or I mustard mean, or something? I mean, I went to art class, but it depends on the shade. Like if it's really a close enough shade, it can make you yellow. Yeah, the thing is in no, art class, you're no, mixing really. paint. So when you mix multiple colors, it gets darker. Most in computer just, science, you're actually mixing light. So when a red and a green light are both on, it gets more bright. The more lights you have on, the more bright it is. And red plus blue, usually with paint is purple, but in computers it becomes pink. Or uh, blue plus green becomes cyan. That's normal. And what happens if you mix red and blue and green together? With paint, you just get mud. But with light, you get perfectly white uh, whiteness. So when all the lights are on, it's white. And when all of them are off, it's black. So with three bits of information, red, blue, and green, you can represent four colors based on whether they're all zero or one, just one of them is on. And then if you have the mixtures, you can have multiple different colors on. So what we're gonna do for the entire audience is we're gonna give you a chance to each come up with your own pixel and submit it into a shared screen where we're all gonna see the pixels people suggest. So basically, if you could go to this URL, bit.ly slash code pixel, or if you have a phone, use the phone's camera to scan this QR code over here. What's gonna happen when you do that is what you do when you click that URL is gonna see a Google form. And inside this Google form, basically what you're gonna see is uh, you can submit your name and you can submit three individual pixels, your red value, your green value and your blue value. And we'll actually see all the values that people submit from all around the, uh, all around the world. And then what we're gonna do is we have this spreadsheet that's gonna actually combine these so that each one of the pixels individually gets converted into colors. And then we're actually gonna lay them out 
like the dots on a screen on a computer screen to actually make a picture that's combining all the picture pixels submitted from students all around the country. Uh, now I'm going to stop my screen share briefly as we do this and switch to show a spreadsheet that actually does this as people are submitting their values. Wait, Dad, your shirt, it's like pixels. Yes, that's pretty funny. When I was getting dressed this morning, Sophia knew that we were going to talk about pixels today. So that's how we decided what to wear today. Um, so we have that spreadsheet that people submitted their information to. And I'm going to love about Google Forms is that it's so easy to get information from a lot of people all into one place quickly. So I'm going to switch to my Google spreadsheet. I'm a little worried because this spreadsheet has had so many people submitting to it all at the same time that I'm not sure if it's even going to work, but oh, we'll it find works. out. <laughs> if it doesn't, it's a bug, but... If it doesn't, it's a bug, we'll find out. It's, it won't actually be a bug, it'll just be that my computer is too slow. So here's a spreadsheet with people submitting uh, their names and their pixels to it. Uh, and it's so laggy that I can barely even load it in time. But you can see pixels gradually coming in as students are, are submitting the, your individual pixels. Whoa, look at all that. That's so cool. So those are all the ones and zeros that everybody submitted from all around the world. And what we've done is we've added conditional formatting, which is a feature in, in Excel. So each person who submitted one, you get a 0, 1, 1 or a 1, 1, 1, and it's making one big monitor. And by the way, we haven't tested this before because we didn't have a thousand students to try this. So. I'm very happy that it actually worked. Can you scroll down? Um, I can scroll down. There's more. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> pixels coming in as people are submitting this. Mm -hmm. Isn't it fun when you build something and it works on the very first try? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that, that never happens. happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, one thing that's cool here is the black ones. You can't see the numbers there, but those are a zero, zero, zero. Uh, Alice, can you tell me how I could actually see the zero, zero, zeros there? Because yeah, I mean, that's the, actually the font. So if you go in and change the font color to white, so I like to use the conditional formatting where I set the font color and the um, fill color to be the same so I wouldn't see the numbers. But in this case, because we do, I would set a contrasting color. So you have conditional formatting. Is depending on what's in the cell, what color to make it. So it says if the cell contains 000, zero, zero it colors it black and I can say if it's zero, 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 I'll change the font to be white. And then I say done. Now we should see all the black ones. You should see the zeros show up in them. But of course, Kevin. Because there's, there's so many cells being calculated all at once. Look at that. Yay. Yeah, it's calculated. I have a now. spreadsheet so much of this, which I did all Minecraft style and it's the same thing. It takes a little bit for it to all load. Yeah, but there it goes. All right, well, that was pretty cool. Everybody got to submit their own pixel and we all made a beautiful photo of I don't know what. It's, <laughs> a, it's just as hard to recognize as our checkerboard or our C, but, but what you realize is how these little digital pieces of information can be used to create uh, a photo on the screen. And if you now look at your screen and you see my face or you see Alice or Mike, every time you look at a computer screen, like if you look at the green behind Alice, uh, Alice, can you talk so we can see the green? Oh, yeah. This is my, uh, my wall at my house. Every little dot on that screen that's green is because there's enough ones to turn on the green lights on her monitor to be on and the red lights and the blue lights are zeros to be off. Every single time you see it, a photo on Instagram, there's a whole bunch of ones and zeros turning on little lights. There's literally more than a million dots on the screen. So more than 10 million ones and zeros coloring every single image and when there's a video happening at 30 frames a second billions of times little ones and zeros are turning on and off lights on your monitor to, to actually change what's what you see on the screen it's kind of crazy that there's billions per second of changes in ones and zeros to turn on lights but that's basically how all computer videos and, and computer photos are, are displayed um, Alice, can you tell us about how else you've used maybe basically technology like this in classrooms for teaching? Yeah, absolutely. I even use something very similar to this with pixel art because I love pixels. And when you make a Google drawing and you go in to resize it, I always like to reset it to pixel sizes because that's the width of your screen. So pixels are a great way for students to create and be um, show what their learning is in a more fun way. So I use alicekeeler.com slash pixel art 
which allows them to select uh, with numbers. They just like paint by number. And I every day I have students sending me what they've been creating because we want students to create. And pixels are one way that students can show what they've learned. Yeah, Wonderful. And in fact, in one of the challenge assignments we're going to send to students next, uh, at the end of this episode includes uh, some, some work that you could do with a different tool for making pixel arts, but it'll be very similar. Um, Alice, there's a lot of students at home uh, and also teachers as well. Do you have any message to share with folks who are basically home by themselves studying during this protracted period of who knows how long school is closed? Yeah, that's a great time though to learn something new. You, in, you're not set at a bell schedule right now is that you can take some time to say like, I wanna learn how to code some images in Instagram and it takes some time. Like, I don't always get it right the first time. So I, it's just an opportunity to kind of breathe and have the time to explore things you're excited about. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we've been spending a lot of time while we're at home. It's our spring break right now in, in Seattle, but Sophia has been doing a lot of coding, but also a lot of other stuff as well. Yeah. Sophia, what have you been doing while you've been at home? I mean, now that I think of it, I can't really decide, but I've done a lot of arts and crafts. A lot of arts and crafts. Yeah. Do you, do you do any Minecraft? Actually, yes, actually. <laughs> She's done a little bit of Minecraft, but we actually, I, we limit our screen time. So we do more coding and creativity when we're on computers and less video games because- You can code in Minecraft, I'm just saying. Minecraft, that's true. Um, I wanna switch to see if we have any, um, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, so Regan B uh, said, what is a factorial? Uh, Alice, do you wanna answer oh, that that's question? That's a great question. So when you wanna multiply the same thing, uh, so five factorial. So it's five times four times three times two times one. So where that comes into play is when you're doing permutation. So I have five people and I pick a leader. Well, now I need to take that leader out. And now I have four people and I pick the second person. So I take that person out. And so I'm looking for how many ways I can take these five people and put them in line. So you multiply them together is a great practical application for factorials. And so you would write it as like five with an exclamation mark. So in her code, each letter has 26 options. So 26 factorial would give you uh, 26 for the first uh, letter, 25 for the second letter, just generating up those numbers. Um, and then there's a question from Melina, a teacher in Los Angeles saying, as we all adjust to teaching from home, many of us teachers have directed our students to code break. What advice do you have for teachers adjusting to remote learning and bringing their students to today's call? or to remote learning in general? Well, my favorite is to be collaborative. I mean, this is times where we can't be together. So looking for tools that allow us to be together. So I love everyone on the same spreadsheet or everyone on the same Google Slides. And if you're a Microsoft Teams user, the Teams chat is just a great way to interact and focus on ways that we can be together when we can't. Yeah. One thing I also recommend is just spending a little bit of time this, these moments aren't just about education, but also about a little bit of inspiration and community because everybody's stuck dealing with just their mom or dad or brother or sister and not getting enough time seeing regular people. So just a little bit of time to, to connect and ask, how are you doing and how's your day uh, can go a long way. Uh, and it's a good time to recognize that school isn't just about math and reading. You can learn all sorts of things like learning to play a new musical instrument, reading a book that you thought was too hard to understand there's so many things we can learn during this time. Um, Alice, thank you so much for joining us. We're halfway through this episode and want to go on to the next stage, but could we switch to gallery view and have everybody say goodbye to Alice and Sophia's gonna play an applause sound for you. Thanks. Bye, Alice. Bye, thanks for having me. All right, uh, Mike, thank you for uh, sitting through the first half of the show. We wanna talk now about your work. Um, so you were born in Brazil, like you mentioned earlier. What brought you to the United States? Yeah, I'm Brazilian, born in Brazil. Uh, I was there until um, I was 18. And um, at the time, there was not a lot of um, computer science and startup sort of uh, education in Brazil. That's really changed now. But at the time, uh, I was really interested in, in programming and, and decided to come to the US because at the time that was where you know, I could come and, and learn. Um, so that was the big leap. Um, but it's been exciting, actually, in the last few years to see so many coding schools and other things appear in Brazil, a lot of interest from people there too now. 
Yeah. So you and I are both immigrants and many American entrepreneurs are immigrants. Uh, but when it comes to technology and computer science, you don't see a lot of successful Latino Americans in tech or in computer science. What was it like going through studying computer science at Stanford and starting your own company being from South America? Well, I think, you know, I think role models are really important, role models and mentors. And one of the things that was hard for me was there weren't just that many uh, other Latinos, other Brazilians who were, you know, have been doing that. So um, one thing I try to do now is when there are people in Brazil who are trying to start something or trying to learn, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to help them because I think it, if you see somebody that, you know, you know, or who has the same background as you do something, it's a lot more helpful and it, it can be inspiring. Um, so I have a question about Instagram. How did the idea for Instagram come about and what was it like creating it in the early days? Were you, what were you doing what, like right before that happened? Uh, where were you and, and your co-founder, Kevin? Can you tell us a little bit about the story of the creation of Instagram? Yeah, so I was, before Instagram, I was working at a startup called Mebo. It's not around anymore, but it would let you basically chat on your computer. Uh, back when like AOL Instant Messenger, it's way before most of yours times, but you know, that was where we were mostly chatting uh, before text messaging. Uh, and I was there and I was, you know, coding and doing some design, um, but then met up with my friend Kevin and he was really interested in doing a company uh, and I was too. And uh, I think, you know, sometimes people think startups like just happen in like a light bulb, but it actually was a lot of sort of trying one thing, seeing that it's it didn't work, and new. Um, so we definitely went through a lot of different, you know, attempts at like, should it work like this? No, that doesn't work. Should it work like that? Um, and so it was a lot of trying things out, seeing if they worked. It took us almost a year to really get to the idea of Instagram, but the idea of Instagram came from trying a lot of other ideas and kind of narrowing down from there. Got it. And did you expect it to be one of the world's largest social networks in history when you were starting it out? Not at all. We were, you know, really trying to do something that we thought was cool that we wanted to use. And, uh, you know, if you asked me to guess how many people would use it ever, maybe I would have said, if we're really lucky, like a million people will use it. Um, and so it was really amazing to see it grow. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, similarly, when we started code.org and the hour of code, we, we kicked off the hour of code with the goal of getting 10 million students to do the hour of code in one week. And in fact, when we said that, we're like, if we ask for 10 million students, we might get 1 million. Yeah. Uh, first week, we had 20 million students. Uh, and we've now, in the six years the Hour of Code has been around, we just passed 900 million hours of code being done, which has been incredible That's to awesome. see. Um, incredible. Th there's another thing I wanted to ask you, because people talk about, you know, when you see stories or movies about people creating things, there's a lot of talk about, about like the special moment of genius, about, like light bulb moment. Did you all have a light bulb moment where like everything came together, like we're going to create Instagram and it's going to have stories and this and that? Uh, or so to us, it was a lot more about sort of figuring one thing out and then trying it and then like going to the next one. We did have the moment though, where uh, we named it, which was kind of a light bulb moment. So, uh, you know, it was just called code name. We didn't have, a, it was just, you know, we didn't have a name for it yet. And I remember uh, me and my co-founder had a, a two like word documents open with a bunch of like starts of words and ends of words. So like Insta pick, We're like that doesn't sound that good. Uh, you know, like cool pick. And then all of a sudden we made Insta and Gram and we're like, whoa, that, that's pretty good. So we decided to go with that. And it works in Portuguese too, like Insta. And it works in a lot of languages, uh, which is important sometimes when you're naming things. So that was our like, okay, let's go with Instagram. Let's like stop looking at this text file. Let's get back to, to building it. Yeah, but the actual coding takes a lot of hard work and grit and late nights more than random strokes of genius, I, I suspect. Exactly. And, you know, and you, it's, you never know if something's going to work until you try it, both on the coding side, but also just on, you know, seeing if some people are going to enjoy it and use it. So you just have to, you know, keep, keep at it. Um, what about Instagram made it resonate so much when people already had Facebook and Twitter and, and sort of other social media outlets? I think because it's so visual. So, you know, it was so international, even from the beginning, like when I, when we started Instagram, my family was still in Brazil and, but through Instagram, I made friends in Japan. I made friends in Europe. I made friends everywhere uh, and got to know people's lives just because you don't have to speak the language. You just have to see the photo. And I think that was something different and new uh, back then. And I think continues to be something that people really like is the, like the fact that it's not really that much about what you write. It's just about what you see and, and what you share. 
So speaking about what you see, I want to switch to the last stage of our lesson. Yeah. We talked about pixels, but now we're going to code a feature of Instagram. Uh, and when you're coding something like Instagram, how much are you worrying about the individual pixels? Or actually not even the pixels, the ones and zeros. Are you dealing with, I want to turn that one on and that one off? Or is it is it easier than, than doing that? Yeah, so the, the, the good news is, you know, I think in the early days, people really were saying like, turn this pixel on, turn this pixel off. And luckily now we're at a level, you know, we call it abstraction where you can like go up a level and, and uh, tell the computer what you want it to do rather than worrying exactly how it's going to do it. So when we were writing things on Instagram, for example, the, you know, different image editing and filters and drawing, you know, you're usually saying, all right, computer or, you know, Xcode or iOS, I want you to draw a line from here to here, a lot like uh, the stars that we saw earlier in the comment. So that's exactly what we're going to do next. What we're going to create is an image doodler, which is one of my favorite features of Instagram. And Sophia, do you use Instagram? No. Why not? Because I'm too young. Because you're not allowed to. That's right. <laughs> Instagram. But uh, if you were old enough to use Instagram, one of the most popular features is if you take a photo, you can doodle on it and draw on it. You can uh, just do that in camera if you go to edit. You can do that in camera as well. Um, and that was like actually the last feature I uh, uh, wrote code for on Instagram was the drawing tool. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Well, so I should be able to help here. That's so awesome that that was basically the last thing you did on Instagram. And now we're going to do it again in the next 15 minutes. Uh, it probably took you longer than 15 minutes. Uh, but <laughs> it's more work to do something at that scale. But we're going to screen share a, a tool on code.org called App Lab. Uh, and this is basically the tool that we use for prototyping apps. And last week, uh, we used it to create a password generator. This week, we're gonna create an image doodler. Uh, here's an image I've chosen, but we have actually four choices of screens we can choose to doodle on. One is flowers. We also have a beach. And then we also have a bird. And then we also have a cat. Uh, this cat is special because it's Sophia's cat. Sunshine. <laughs> His, his name is Mr. Sunshine. Uh, and we want to choose which image to doodle uh, on. So before we actually write the code, can we run a live poll for the audience to choose which of these four images we choose between? I already know what's... Like cats are very big on Instagram. Oh. Cats are very big on Instagram. Yes. Sophia's <laughs> pretty excited because she was hoping her cat would get selected. I think, I think you'll like this is this is trending in a good direction here. Cat and beach are kind of duking it out. Uh, but I think because we're speaking, we have a little bit of an advantage here on the cat side. All right, can we show the poll results? <laughs> All right, so All right. more than half of you wanted the cat, so that's what we're gonna go with. Um, so I'm gonna make this the default screen for our app. So when we start the app, that's what we see. Uh, and now we're gonna go into the code for this. So when we want to make the code for an image doodler, what we're gonna use is we're gonna use the, uh, the turtle commands in the app. Uh, but you know what's fun is I learned to code when I was 12 or 13 using Logo, which was the sort of grandfather of the turtle tool. So that was really, you know, it's been helping people learn to code for a long time. Exactly. So the turtle tool lets you basically say things like move forward, move backward, moves to this in the X and Y location and it draws as you get there. But we want to know, we want to make it follow along as our mouse does this. So I'm going to add an event handler first. So I'm gonna say when an event happens, and the event that I'm gonna look for is on the, on the cat screen, anytime there's any movement of the mouse of any sort. So when the mouse moves at any point, we're gonna have the turtle move to that point. And what point do we deal with? I'm gonna put the a variable here, so the event handler, and I'm gonna have us move to event.x and event.y. In past versions of Codebreak, we learned about events, so like an event, like a button click. But with a mouse move event, we actually get an event x and an event y. So when I hit run on the screen, you can see as I move the mouse, it should be drawing, although I'm not sure why it isn't. Maybe it's because my computer is not moving enough. It's a bug. Is it a bug? Do we need to debug this? I didn't expect to be debugging this right now. Why is it drawing to a weird place on the screen? I must have misspelled something. Oh, I didn't do move to, I did move. Oof. That's 
I'm going to draw this again. So I thought I was going to move that that far away from where it's from the center of the screen. So it was going really far. <laughs> and all right. So I'm using the move blocks now. When I hit run, as okay. I move the mouse, I can see a bunch of doodling happening. It took literally three lines of code and a few seconds of debugging to make this. But there's a few problems with this. First of all, you can see the little arrow of this little turtle guy, and I don't want that to be showing up. And then the second thing is I can't stop doodling. Uh, I'm not holding my mouse down. It's just doodling whatever I do. So there's a couple of things I want to do first. I'm going to stop this code. And first, I'm going to use the hide block to hide that little triangle. Uh, and I'm also going to set the pen color. Uh, what color should I start this as? Blue. Blue. I like blue. All right, blue. Well, Sophia clearly likes blue. Um, but the other thing I want to do is I want to make sure so that the pen doesn't start as drawing. So I'm going to start with the pen up. So now when I hit run, it doesn't do anything when I move around the mouse. Um, and what I want to do is when I hit the mouse down, I want it to draw. So only when I have a mouse down event, so when the cat screen gets a mouse down event, and we're going to be done real soon with a very basic image doodler. When the cat screen gets a mouse down event, I'm going to first move to that location. I'm using the move to block correctly this time. Yay. And I'm going to move to that location just like before event.x and event.y. And the other thing I'm going to do is put the pen down when that happens. And the other, there's another thing I need to do. So that's what happens when the mouse goes down. What should I, what, is there something else I'm missing, Mike? Do you want to help me out? Okay, you got down, you got to move to that place, put the pen down, and then you also need to handle the mouse up. Exactly. Mike did not know I was going to call on him for something like that. So mouse up. And when I have the mouse up, what should I do? Uh, you want to do a pen up. Yeah. So basically now we have a situation. I don't need the event there because I don't need the X and Y. So now if I move around the mouse, nothing happens. But if my mouse is down, I'm drawing. And when my mouse is up, I'm not drawing. And my mouse is clicked down, I'm drawing again, and so on. So we can do more interesting stuff to our doodler as well. So I want to add some other features. What are some of the features that image doodlers have that are that are fun? We got to pick a color. We could pick a color. So I'm going to let us choose between three different colors. So I'm going to add buttons to help us choose colors. So this will be button one and button two and button three. And we'll have three colors to choose. I'll let Sophia choose one of them and then Mike to choose one. And then the audience can choose a third color. Sophia, what do you want as the color for your first button? Blue again. Blue? Yes. All right. So that's a good blue. That's a good blue. And I'll take this text off so it doesn't say button. All right, Mike, what do you want for the next button? Uh, let's make it red. Red. That's red. pink. Oh, sorry. There you go. That's pretty good red. And I'll take get rid of the text on this one. And now let's do an audience poll so the audience can choose the color for the next button. So can we put the poll on the screen of the, the different color options? I think we have color options queued up for a poll. If we don't. We have a chat. Mm -hmm. All right, we don't have the color options ready for a poll. Um, so why don't we use a show of hands? Um, we're going to have a choice between, uh, we're going to choose between green and yellow. If you want the, the button to be green, click the raise hand button. It looks like this, if you can see this. And we're going to count how many people raise their hands. Well, it looks more like this, but. So you need to click the raise hand button to see, oh my god, my screen is getting filled with people raising their hands. I can't see anything. All right, I saw so many raised hands. Which color did I say if you want I to think raise it's your green. hand? It was green. green. It was definitely green. All right, we're going to go with green. 
I can't even see what's going on, on my screen anymore because Zoom has covered it with raise hand buttons. Lower your hands, please. All right. <laughs> we have all the hands lowered, and I'm going to try to change this to green. Right, so this third button is green. So now we have red, blue, and green buttons. And I'm also gonna change the text of this to not be button. So we have these three buttons now. Having the buttons isn't enough to actually change the color of our doodler. So now we actually need to write the code for doing this as well. So for doing this, now we need to actually go back into code mode and we need to write the code for what happens when any of these buttons are clicked. So what I want is when I hit run, if I click the blue button or if I click the red button, it should change this to be red colored. So how can I do that? Can you help me out here, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we're gonna wanna do is add a new event handler. And when you handle each button event, we're gonna set the pen color to each different, um, each different color. All right, so button two, which is the blue one, is gonna go and say, set the pen color button two is blue and then i'm going to go on event when button three is pressed and by the the numbers of these buttons when i hover over it it shows me that this is button three Ooh, and that it looks like your video might have frozen so i don't know if you can uh stop and reshare to have it pop up again thank you I will do that. I will stop the share. Thanks so much. Of course. If you, you want to hold up the bug button to show I that we're debugging. <laughs> you don't have it. Okay. There so we go. The thing is when button two is clicked, when button three is clicked, when each one of these buttons gets clicked, we're going to change the pen color. So when button three is clicked, we're going to choose pen color red. And when button four is clicked, and by the way, this may look like we're adding a lot of code, but it's so much less code to do it than I'm sure when you were doing it in Instagram, yeah. in Xcode, to be able to just say, change the button, the pen color. Color, exactly. All right, and green. All right, so now we have, so now we can click run and it defaults to blue and I can click red and now I got red. Perfect. And green as well. I wanna add one more feature, which is to let you choose the width of the doodler, because as I was doodling, it's kind of hard to see. Um, Let's so add a slider. You want to use a slider, Sophia? Mm -hmm. So we'll put a slider to change the width. Uh, and I'm going to make it a bigger slider so we can, it goes all the way across. So, and this slider basically will have a, a value that it shows. Um, so, where did my screen go? I think my screen share just stopped again. Mm -hmm. Should I get my bug? <laughs> no, you think we're okay like without the bug. Um, so now what we wanna do is when the slider changes, we change the pen width as well. And this again is really simple. So we're gonna do another on event handler. And Mike, you haven't seen how this works, but I'm gonna pull an on event. Yeah, this is new. This is new. And when we say the slider, the slider is what's going to generate the event. And the question is, what event do you think we're going to look for? Uh, probably change. So I'm going to look for the change event on the slider. So when the slider changes, and that's a good guess, um, now we're going to go to the turtle and change the pen width of the turtle. And when the slider gets a change, equal slider. we don't want to change the, the okay. value to three. We can basically find out the value of the slider by saying getting the text. Oops, it looks like you froze again on the video. Did I freeze again? Just the share. Oh, no. Uh, this is tough. I think I should get the bug killer. Thank you so much for calling that. This doesn't happen usually when we do this. I'm not sure why it's happening now. All right, can you see it now? Uh, I can see it now. Great, so we're getting the text from the... And width to the value in the slider. So if the slider is low, we have one value, and if it's high, we have another value. So if I get the text from the slider, now when I hit run, I can set the slider to a big width, and now I get a huge... Yeah. 
doodle. And if I have a small width, I have a small doodle. And I can it. switch to green and have a small doodle. Yeah. And I can switch to a big width sense, and have a big doodle. Oh, yeah. um, so we basically have an image doodler. Now you might not want the value to be big. So there's lots of bugs in this thing that we created so far. But this is the basics of an image doodler. Uh, and it's one of the most popular features in Instagram. And it took only about 20 lines of code to create. What's particularly cool about this is we can now share this out. And I can click Send to Phone. And so if any of you are at home and have a phone as well, you can look at this QR code that you see on the screen. And if you hold out your phone with your camera and scan that QR code, the app that we just created your, on your camera, you should see a little uh, bubble at the top of your phone and you can actually see a link. And then literally the app that, kept, that we just wrote together right now, Mike and I and Sophia, can now be on your phone and you can actually do your own image doodle. It should work on Android or iOS phones. Mike, are you doing it? Yep, there yeah. it is. Sophia's cat is now Sorry, in the hands of hundreds of students. Um, the really cool thing about this is that we wrote this code just now, we created it, and every one of you can now start image doodling. But that image doodler that we had is missing a lot of features. What are some features, Mike, that you think students can add to it? Oh, um, let's see. Um, there's always more colors. Um, what else could they do? Um, they could... Stickers, stickers are a great idea. Yeah, could do stickers. You could let the, the, the pen change colors while you're drawing. That would be a really fun advanced feature. Oh, like so that, like it becomes a rainbow kind of? It becomes a rainbow. We had that as a little Easter egg in our drawing one and people really liked it. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna stop the sh screen share now. So we shared out that app via the QR code, but we're also gonna send it via email and when you get the app via email, any app that anybody creates on code.org, you can remix and make your own versions of it, uh, which is pretty cool. And that's actually one of the challenge things. We're going to ask students to make their own version of the image doodler, add features to it, and then we'll have you present that to, to next week's special guest, who's going to be an extremely special, special guest. Uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to share who it is yet. We're going to be announcing no. that. I'm, I'm not. Secret. It's secret. We're going to be not. I don't know. It's great. You don't even know. Um, I think I know. His first name is Bill. Oh, that's that's the most I'm going to be able to say. Oh. That's um, too much. That's not too much. <laughs> created a monster. All right. <laughs> um, so let's switch to see if there's questions for that folks have for Mike. Um, Mike, there's a question from uh, actually Akira. Can you come on screen? Akira has been managing collecting the questions in the background. Akira is basically one of the behind the scenes producers of Codebreak. Uh, and if we could get her on screen to ask the, the questions for Mike. Hello, everyone. Yeah, Thank so you. Mike, one of the questions we have from Sebastian, it was how do you manage your time and what do your days look like now, both pre-pandemic and during pandemic? Yeah, um, so I'm uh, working on a new project with my Instagram co-founder right now that has to do with COVID and we're trying to get some good information out there. Um, so I think, one of the things that I've learned is it's easy for me to get very deep in coding and kind of lose track of the rest of the world. That's probably happened to some of you as you as you learn things. And it's been uh, a lesson I've learned over time that it's really worth taking some breaks, going on a little walk. We have a dog, so playing with the dog, seeing my daughter, like whatever those different things are. It might feel in the moment like you're like, oh, but I'm just coding. I just can code for another hour. But in the long run, it's really nice to make sure you've got some ability to get some fresh air. Trust me, I definitely had some Instagram days where I would like get up and be like, I haven't showered in three days. I haven't gotten up from my chair in 12 hours. So learning to have a little bit of a, of a break every now and then is really important. Thank you so much. And our second question is for both Mike and Hadi. The student said, I'm interested in pursuing something related to computer science. Um, what should I do at home in order to prepare myself? And also, is there any code.org content I should look for? So both Mike from your experience when you were younger and Hadi from the code.org perspective. I loved like um, basically seeing how things were built. So um, as you learn to code, if there's something that you're really interested, like if there's a website that you think is really cool or if there's a project that you see online, um, in a lot of cases, the code is an online, if it's on GitHub, if it's on, if it's linked from code.org. Um, so 
uh, I learned a lot just from seeing how other people did their projects. Um, and I think there's that's one of the things I love about computer science is there's a real culture of sharing. Like you do something interesting and then you can tell the world how you did it. There's tutorials. Um, so I think that's a really good way to, to continue to learn. Yeah, and, and there's so many, one of the beauties of computer science is it's perfect for the time we're in right now because computer science is something where part of the learning comes from a teacher in a classroom, but a huge part of it just comes from experimentation, trying something, seeing how it breaks, trying it a different way. You know, most subjects in school are, are about a right or wrong answer. Did you get the answer right? Did you get it wrong? When we made our image doodler, there's bugs, but if you find, you always run into bugs and then you fix it and is the right color red or green or blue, you can choose what you want. You know, you, you get some expressiveness and creativity. Uh, and, and working with other people's projects is one great way. Uh, if you visit code.org, if you're in, in, in high school, middle school, or elementary school, there's, uh, there's courses there for all ages to learn. So uh, if you haven't done it at all, our express course on code.org is one of the best ways to do it. If you're in school and your school offers computer science principles, that's the most popular high school course in computer science right now. There's over 100,000 students, almost 150,000 students all across the United States taking that course with code.org right now. Uh, so if you're in high school, please sign up for computer science principles for next year. And if your school doesn't offer it, ask the principal to offer it. Code.org will prepare your existing teachers. Uh, so that's a wonderful way to do it. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. So I want to tell people we're going to send you email with assignments for this week. If you're not on our email list, go to code.org slash break so you can get the assignments for this week. Uh, 